I know I've had a few issues with internet in Nairobi where my power is gone. So I'm on 4G at the moment. So let's just give people a few more seconds to join so we can, we can give them a chance. Okay, so I think we're going to kick it off just for those who are listening in and hopefully more people can join us along the way. Um, so thank you so much for joining our Twitter space today. Um, it comes at a really important time, of course, with COP27 starting in Sham el-Sheikh in Egypt. Uh, my name is Nazanin Mashiri and I am a senior analyst at the International Crisis Group working on climate security based in Nairobi, but working across Africa. To give you a little bit of an intro into what we are or who we are at the International Crisis Group, we're an independent organisation with more than 20 years experience in working to prevent, mitigate and solve deadly conflict around the world. So the Crisis Group was founded over 25 years ago by a group of diplomats who were despaired by the lack of international response to the tragedies in Bosnia and in Rwanda. So they created this group to research the roots of conflicts to talk to all sides, which is what we endeavour to do, and to provide policymakers with concrete proposals to prevent, end, or at least mitigate conflicts. So we usually do this through research led directly from conflict afflicted countries, where our analysts engage directly with all parties to conflict, share multiple perspectives and propose practical policy solutions. And then we publish reports and timely commentaries or briefings to inform decision-making and shape the public debate on how to limit threats to peace and security. And we work with heads of government, policymakers, civil society, conflict actors themselves, to basically sound the alarm of impending conflict and to open paths to peace. And we set up the Future of Conflict Department, which is what I basically work with. And we set it up basically to look at these issues, including climate security, um, and delve deeper into them and provide more sort of evidence-based uh, reports and also hopefully some concrete recommendations in these really difficult times. But I'm really happy to say that I'm joined today by Andrew Chachi, who's my colleague at Crisis Group. He is a climate, environment and conflict researcher. And also joining us is Giorgio Drabelti, who works on climate and environment Finance at the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Just to let you know, um, listeners who are tuning in, you can DM your questions to at Crisis Group, and we will have a Q and A session hopefully a little bit later on, where we will hopefully be able to answer your questions or try to anyway. Um, you can also find more about our work uh, that we're doing. Uh, on our website www.crisisgroup.org and we have a COP campaign page there and you can just check out everything that we've done so far um, sort of highlighting various issues of, for COP27. Uh, so as we know uh, the 27th UN Climate Change Conference of the party kicked off in Sham el-Sheikh and we can already see that climate financing is pretty high up there on the agenda so at the last COP in Glasgow, uh, we saw that reducing future greenhouse gas emissions took centre stage. And of course, it's still important at this COP. But what we're seeing in this COP is that Egypt is really determined to make sure the focus is on drumming up greater financial support for states struggling with the effects of climate change. So we're seeing that donors are being push, pushed to follow through with their commitments to help climate affected states tackle challenges such as you know, livelihoods being impacted, growing displacement we're seeing, uh, for example, um, on the continent in Africa, and also competition for land and water that we tend to see when these situations arise. So I'd like to turn to my colleague, Andrew, who's done quite a bit of analysis on, on this issue about how conflict prevents climate financing. Andrew, do you want to just take us through a little bit uh, of your research and what you found and, you know, what kind of recommendations you have, thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Nazanin. And uh, to reiterate, my name is Andrew Chachi. I'm a climate, environment, and conflict researcher at the International Crisis Group. And um, as Nazanin was, was was explaining, you know, this, this COP, the, the Egyptian hosts have kind of been clear that it's going to be an implementation COP, you know, back on the African continent, which has disproportionately been impacted by climate change, despite contributing roughly only 3% of historical emissions. And this is particularly relevant related to our work, which examines kind of the various pathways between climate change and violence. Well, you know, climate change is one of many factors that contribute to elevated conflict risks. It certainly is a risk multiplier. And across the African continent, particularly in the Horn, we're witnessing many of those indirect and complex pathways between climatic distress and violence. And uh, let me quickly, to give you a brief overview, identify some of those pathways. The first is kind of with cascading risks. So how uh, extreme heat and precipitation can uh, undermine livelihoods and exacerbate conflict over land and resources. The second would be extreme weather events. Think floods, droughts, and displacement that can exacerbate conflict uh, both in the areas that are affected, but also in areas where these people who are affected relocate. And finally, over transboundary water disputes uh, and, and raising the prospect of tensions uh, geopolitically between states. But again, the African continent is uniquely uh, vulnerable to climate change and violence. Half of the countries uh, across the globe experiencing conflict and crisis are also extremely vulnerable to climate change. So this makes it an increasingly important issue uh, at and around conversation COP, uh, while uh, it is a promising development that uh, the Egyptian Nose have, have organized a variety of side events uh, surrounding COP on climate security, it is still uh, formally left off of the agenda. And this, our research, I think, will hopefully illuminate some of the ways that it's really important to incorporate uh, in conversations and negotiations. So essentially what Crisis Group has done uh, is we have analyzed some uh, climate-related development assistance uh, that is administered, this data set by the OECD and our colleague, Giorgio, our colleague, our, our fellow panelist, Giorgio, will, will, will explain that in greater detail. But essentially, um, we examined climate financing flows or this official development-related assistance financing flows to countries experiencing conflict and crisis, and the findings are absolutely harrowing. Um, uh, essentially, conflict-affected countries receive roughly one-third the amount of this type of financing for adaptation as those at peace, roughly 5 versus $15 per capita. Uh, that is absolutely uh, anemic, particularly when you consider uh, intensity of conflicts. For the conflicts that are most intense, the top 10%, that, that gap widens to roughly uh, five to one, uh, which, which is deeply troubling. Uh, and, and this has also come as, you know, while the 100 billion goal and other financing goals have not met, uh, there has been increases over the past 10 years, but that gap between conflict-affected countries and those at peace has widened. So it, it demonstrates some of the systematic issues these countries have in, 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 in accessing and operationalizing finance. Furthermore, even when this funding arrives, we found that it's predominantly in the forms of, form of loans. This is particularly uh, uh, troubling as many countries experiencing conflict are already uh, experiencing significant levels of debt distress. So it's kind of compounding uh, their woes. Two-thirds of this uh, the data that we analyzed was in the form of, of, of a debt instrument or a loan, not in terms of grant-based financing, which, which, which is problematic uh, for those countries. Uh, and, you know, there, there are a variety of reasons why this could be, we can get in greater detail during the Q&A, but essentially, you know, donors prefer, prefer safer bets. And obviously, if you have active conflict and instability and climate change, it makes it very hard, or hard to implement this adaptation program and resilience programming. But secondly, um, a lot of the uh, accreditation and, and kind of ways to access this financing uh, is extremely difficult for conflict-affected countries, which tend to experience um, uh, issues such as corruption and, and, and lack of transparency, which are co required to qualify. But um, our analysis kind of adds some uh, texture to those broader headline findings by zooming into three cases across the horn, which, uh, as many of our listeners know, is experiencing uh, experience its fourth consecutive historic uh, season of failed rains, the worst likely, the, the, the last likely, the, wor the worst on record, uh, and, and simultaneously with um, uh, historic floods in areas like South Sudan. So we zoomed into Kenya, South Sudan, and Somalia to kind of impact how conflict-affected countries struggle to access and operationalize this finance. We found uh, that even in Kenya, which receives the most financing in the region, is relatively the, 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 the most free of conflict. Uh, the, the financing it receives is predominantly in the form of loans, kind of delineating that first point I mentioned uh, earlier. Secondly, South Sudan, uh, which is which is ravaged by a recent civil war and, and consecutive years of consecutive years of historic flooding, uh, has received roughly only one percent of the amount uh, it needs to adapt to climate change, which is absolutely uh, uh, very problematic. Finally, it's Somalia, where nearly three quarters of a million people are living under Al Shabaab and cannot have access to climate financing and any form of humanitarian assistance, uh, which which obviously exacerbates their risk of insecurity. But um, we have a couple of you know suggestions for our analysis uh, for, for delegates at COP. The first would be that donors need to scale up. Uh, financing and meet the $100 billion commitment, which was extended uh, to 2025 and made uh, to the COP in Copenhagen. Secondly, they must equitably distribute that aid between countries at conflict and those not. Uh, and, and, and finally, you know, they need to kind of consider the way that conflict sensitivity can strengthen interventions in areas that are being left behind and overlooked that are experiencing conflict. But I'll turn it back over to you, Nazanin, to, to dive deeper into those cases and, and share some of our field analysis that kind of contextualize those headline findings. 
Andrew, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for your in-depth research and recognitions there for COP. Um, participants, I hope they're listening. <laughs> Um, but let's get going over to Julie. So, uh, Nazanin, good morning, uh, good afternoon to everyone. This is Giorgio from OECD. I think uh, uh, there was some uh, um, audio problem from Nazanin, but I, I heard my name. Okay, well, it seems that Giorgio... ...who is unable to join us at the moment. Oh, he... he's, he's there. Okay. Um, Nazni, I believe Nazni is having some issues with her audio, um, but to, to perhaps give Giorgio a chance to share some of his insights whilst, whilst Nazni's connection um, uh, recovers. Uh, Giorgio Gilberti from uh, the, the OECD, uh, we'd love to, to, to hear your insights about, you know, the, the OECD data set that, you know, we talked about development, uh, public related development assistance and kind of talking about some of the general trends you've uh, assessed on, on the OECD side and managing that data set regarding uh, uh, this form of financing. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, thank you, Andrea, uh, Andrew, and thank you, Nazanin, for, for this invitation. This is super important topic and super interesting. So I'm happy to be here with you. So first of all, I would like to give you some uh, some uh, context, some data about uh, climate finance uh, and climate-related development finance, which are actually two different things. So uh, at the OECD, we just published uh, and we just presented at the COP actually one report on the progress towards the 100 billion uh, the 100 billion goal. As indeed, as you said, the 100 billion goal that was supposed to be met by 2020 was not met and we calculated that, that uh, uh, although increasing climate finance because that's that's the truth it's increasing it didn't reach 100 billion but we cap we put it at around 80 83 um, usd billion in 2020 and there are some interesting things uh, here to say as particular about uh, um, adaptation, because for the first time in, in I mean, we saw an, an increase in adaptation finance in the latest years. If we calculate these amounts with the UNFCCC methodology, which is what is in the 100 billion OECD report, we have around 28 billion of, uh, uh, of uh, adaptation finance uh, in 2020, and also plus around 6 billion of uh, climate finance that has dual objective. That means that it supports both mitigation and adaptation. Interestingly, so we, we calculate what is the share of this that goes to fragile context. And we say that this is about around 22% of the total, so around 16.5 billion of the total. However, I have to say that uh, um, this is a little bit different than your number. It goes in the same direction, but it's a bit different than your numbers because the uh, OECD methodology to calculate fragile context does not only take into um, account uh, war, but also many other uh, many other issues like hunger of spot, commodity dependence, and high indebtedness, inequality, and so on. I mean, all these things are obviously very clearly. Um, uh, connected, but uh, the country list may be may be different because it takes into account a multidisciplinary uh, matrix of uh, of fragility. Then uh, zooming a little bit on Africa, what can we say is that always looking at the 100 billion methodology, we have that Africa got around 26 percent of the uh, climate finance across uh, developing countries region between 2016 and 2020. While, for example, Asia take 42% and South America 17. And uh, um, this is also another important thing that, uh, that we wanted to say. If we look at the data that we have uh, uh, on uh, uh, concessional finance, well, this is a little bit uh, different because we see that in, uh, it follows a different methodology, but we see a, a stronger and stronger push on uh, on uh, on adaptation, and uh, uh, particularly in the latest uh, in the latest year 2020. But we have also to say that 
the share, uh, if you look just at uh, concessional finance by DAC members, what is normally called as aid, we have that uh, 32 percent of the total aid, so concessional finance by DAC members, goes to Africa. But we have only 25 percent of uh, climate-related aid that goes to Africa. This, what does it mean? In practice, it means there's a lower share that the African, the African continent as a whole is able to attract a lower share of uh, climate-related aid than other continents, uh, particularly the, than Asia. And another uh, thing that I wanted to, to tell you uh, that I want to highlight is that anyway, this climate uh, aid for for Africa is is more about adaptation than mitigation. While in other continents, like for example in Asia, with the test, I mean, of course, different uh, different characteristics. The mitigation part, uh, the mitigation part, is uh, is um, is higher. So this is just the first uh, first two uh, data just to start the conversation, and I um, give the floor back to you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you so much for that, uh, Georgia. That was, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, Nazanin, I just want to give you the opportunity to jump in if your connection stabilized. Otherwise, there are certainly, certainly many things I would love to, to, to riff off of. Oh, Nazanin, uh, go, go. And um, we'll be happy to answer those questions. To, to delve in a little bit deeper, because obviously at Crisis Group, we are a conflict prevention organization. And we have been looking at the links and the potential impact um, of climate change on conflict and security. And in my research, I've been looking in particular at Kenya and in Somalia, here in the Horn of Africa, where we are. Um, so as Andrew mentioned, we are facing uh, probably one of the consecutive droughts uh, on record. Um, we've had four consecutive years of failed rains and we are currently looking at potential fifth failed season at the moment. The rains in October were pretty poor and there is a lot there is a good chance that the failed rains could go on to 2023 so into next year as well so in somalia where i spent part of uh, september um, doing some research in Mogadishu, by drought but also of course by conflict and there are about 7.8 million people who are suffering from hunger at the moment and as we know the state is battling a lot of clan militia and some international forces a pro pro government central government or federal member state government and we've seen them sometimes destroying water points as well or even poisoning wells too so in terms of climate financing the situation is real, you know, here on the ground in northern Kenya, um, in Somalia, in South Sudan, in parts of Uganda, in Ethiopia. It's really important um, that climate adaptation happens and, and comes through, particularly to areas that are suffering from conflict. But also we need to take account of the conflict dynamics, too. So when we're looking at climate related programming, it's really important that the people who are forming the programming or implementing it have a deep understanding of conflict dynamics and risks, which are often very, very local. We need to also understand the governance situation. We need to understand the politics too, um, and make sure that those funds reach people directly, the people who need it the most, the people who are suffering uh, from the drought, the pastoralists who've lost millions of livestock, the the farmers who are unable to harvest crops. So it's really important that we look at this look at both sides of, of the story, both the, the climate fragility and the conflict issues too. So let's just look at COP27. I know that Andrew had some 
recommendations there. But I think it's really important that we sort of focus on what's going on at COP at the moment. And, you know, what are the chances, Andrew, uh, that the recommendations that we have about you know, funding, um, about people, particularly in areas where there's conflict or political violence, receiving their fair share? You know, these, these, these countries have been underfinanced. And what are the chances that this COP will be, you know, the breakthrough COP in terms of climate financing? What are your thoughts on this? Thank you so much for that question, Nazanin. Uh, it's a hard one. And unfortunately, as an optimist, I don't know if I can give you uh, an answer that I would like. Uh, I do not expect this COP to be decisive. I mean, obviously, it's still early, um, decisive in terms of making sure countries are going to receive their fair share. I mean, I mean, I think uh, Georgia's stat, uh, particularly about Africa disproportionately receiving less compared to other regions, you know, is kind of indicative and descriptive of what we found in our analysis and obviously what needs to be remedied at negotiations. I mean, if you look at there was a report released the last couple of days by the previous uh, hosts of the last two cops. And it said that, you know, one trillion need of, of climate finance needs to be un un unlocked by 2030. And by 2030, trillions of dollars are needed for these countries to adapt. And if you look, I mean, they didn't, you know, developed countries, wealthy countries, donor countries didn't um, provide the, the 100 million goal by 100 billion goal, excuse me, annually by 2020. Uh, and they had to extend it to 2025. So it really, you know, I think there's there, there are things indicating that it's trending in the right direction, certainly. But um but in terms of this being kind of like a watershed moment, I, I you know, it's still out and I'm, and I'm uncharacteristically uh, kind of pessimistic. Uh, it, just to underscore some of the points you were making, and that I think Georgia was from the OECD side, it, this, this financing is just so elusive, but also it can make such a difference. You know, a lot of times people think, oh, you know, these countries are experiencing conflict. It's unstable. How, how far can the money go if people with guns are, are running around, right? And, and, and it's, un, it's unsafe for operational assistance, uh, to operationalize assistance. But, you know, there, there is a lot that can be done with just some more money. I mean, South Sudan, right, we found that only 1% of, of, of the amount requested in its NDC was administered. Uh, you know, there, there's so much to be done from dike construction uh, in areas like Bentiu uh, to, to, to kind of increasing river capacity uh, to kind of decrease the propensity of flooding. There's so much that can be done and it's just so anemic. So before, you know, people can kind of have the knee-jerk reaction saying, oh, well, you know, we, we can't really do much with that much more funding because of the conflict. Kind of, the amount of financing is just so low to begin with uh, compared to the need. Um, but I hope uh, that answers uh, your question, Nazbin, and, and over back to you. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Andrew. Um, and we've so far seen this COP, um, Scotland offering compensation funds to vulnerable nations. Um, and we've also seen, you know, vulnerable nations, including you know, African negotiators looking for loss and damage competition, etc. Um, and interestingly, um, we, we had the South Africa's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, um, who basically said that more climate funding needs to come in the forms of grants and concessional loans. This is to avoid the continent ramping up debt. So, Giorgio, can you just explain what this means? Like, why do we need climate financing to come in the form of grants um, rather than, you know, concessional loans? What, what, what kind of difference does that make? Thank you. So this is a, a, an important question, a question that always uh, Always come up so if if climate finance should be grants, should be concessional loans, should be mobilized climate finance. So uh, what we say in uh, what we see in the in the Paris uh, Declaration and I mean in the UNF Triple C context is that we need more finance. We need really more finance because climate challenges is so big that grants alone cannot really tackle the issue. And grants are super important, but they also should go to the activities and to the countries where they could do uh, most because the, the grants funding is unfortunately limited and uh, for certain type of activities, loans, like kind of, for example, infrastructure and uh, uh, guarantees and things that are able to mobilize additional private financing are able with one dollar of creating much more effects on the ground. So it's uh, difficult to say what is the right share or wrong share of, 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 of grants in general, but of course there are some activities which are uh, um, more, uh, uh, where grants are the most effective instruments and there are others where, for example, think about financing of large infrastructure, this cannot be done by, 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 by grants money, and uh, uh, where this is the most uh, adequate uh, financial tools. But this is really, really, context dependent and uh, this also brings me back again what uh, what Andrew said uh, and what you said before I mean it's absolutely important to have more climate finance it's absolutely important particularly in the Horn of Africa and in the Sahel where the 
uh, climate uh, is uh, changing, is warming, it's so severe, the effect of climate change is so severe that uh, we have more adaptation. But uh, for the conflict zone, it's important not only more money, but uh, uh, also that this should be conflict sensitive. I mean, so I mean, should be uh, delivered in ways in which it does not exacerbate the conflicts, but on the other hand, is able through uh, in a certain way, I mean, uh, to, to, to improve the, the, the condition of the population that is already affected, affected by conflict. And so it's a super complicated thing to do. So, uh, and this also explains why, why uh, your numbers, I mean, the numbers in your analysis uh, uh, speaks clearly about the difficulties of, uh, of, uh, of channeling a match fund in, in those areas. Okay, I hope, hope you guys can still hear me because my connection is really unstable. Um, just wanted to remind our listeners, you can DM questions, so direct message questions to at Crisis Group on Twitter, um, and then hopefully we can, we can answer them. And also, we are recording this session, and we will put it up on our website. Um, so you can go to our website, um, www.crisisgroup.org. Um, and we do have a COP uh, campaign page there that you can see all the work that we've been doing. Some of the good work that Andrew's been doing as well um, is up there too. Um, just going back to COP27, uh, I mean, we've got like more than 100 world leaders who are there at the moment. But interestingly, Andrew, we do have some notable no-shows uh, China's leadership and India's too. Um, you know, we've got lead there the work leaders of the world's largest and third largest gas um, gas emitters. Um, they're not present. Um, we've had some interesting, um, you know, comments from France Emmanuel Macron and also British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Um, they're among the biggest names who spoke on Monday, um, and we're hoping also to hear from U.S. President Joe Biden as well, who is going to be at COP. Um, but looking generally, I guess the worry really was that this. COP um, would be overshadowed by, you know, what we're seeing in terms of Russia's war in Ukraine with rising energy prices um, and basically governments prioritising the security of supply over, I guess, the transition to cleaner energy and also over climate financing for adaptation for poorer countries. I mean, just looking at COP, do you think, um, Andrew and Giorgio, do you think that COP will be overshadowed by these other important geopolitical events in the world right now. Thank you so much for that question, Nazanin. Um, I'll, I'll be brief, so perhaps Giorgio can add any insights. But I mean, of course, you know, it's impossible to, to divorce uh, the conversations in Tramel Sheikh now from, from this year's geopolitics and certainly the absences of, of uh, the Chinese government leadership and, and, and Russian leadership, and leadership is, <clears throat> is absolutely problematic for the, for, for the state of negotiations. Uh, you know, I, I think... Europe in and of itself is, you know, kind of walking a very tight line, you know, insofar as trying to, as you mentioned, you know, protect and preserve their own energy security and deal with rising uh, energy prices, whilst also kind of promoting, you know, uh, climate ambition abroad elsewhere. And I think, it, you know, in conversations with folks that, you know, in various African capitals that at times can, can seem a bit uh, puzzling, you know, wherein, you know, Europe's looking to, you know, increase production or explore increasing not the cleanest forms of production to stabilize their system, but also kind of pushing, you know, a lot of those in, 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 in Africa and other parts of the developing world to kind of be climate ambitious and, and, and I think that, that that certainly could, you know, have the potential to, to, to destabilize or, or, or present problems of consensus. Nonetheless, though, um, it, it is still reassuring, uh, you know, Rishi Sunak deciding to, to eventually reverse course and, and, and go to COP and, and, and various statements and, and, and pledges made there. Um, over to you, Giorgio, if you have any insights to, to top that off. So thank you, Andrew. I mean, this is a super important uh, question also. What I would like to say is that two things. One is that, uh, of course, uh, no COP uh, happens in an uh, empty space. I mean, we are all uh, going uh, one crisis after the other. And so in a certain way, I mean, the, the climate change crisis is, is the biggest one, I mean, in the, in the long run. And we should not, uh, I mean, uh, we cannot change strategy, I mean, as an international community every year. So it's, it's super important that, yes, there is every year a different uh, topic that comes up that can diverge uh, attention, but uh, climate change, we, we should remain focused. The second thing I would like to to, um, to highlight, I mean, what is uh, Faith Birol, I mean, the, the Secretary General of the International Energy Agency, just saying uh, everywhere, because uh, uh, in, the, in the latest months, I mean, this crisis, which is I mean, a, a crisis uh, that is that was caused by the Russian invasion in Ukraine and uh, uh, rising energy prices and inflation. And, and there are uh, multiple uh, crisis points that are hitting, of course, developing countries most. But this is, should not be uh, um, should not discourage 
uh, investment in mitigation. Actually, exactly the contrary. I mean, if we have an inflationary point, a food price, food security issues that are linked to the energy prices, then this is exactly the right moment to go full speed on uh, going through mitigation action to changing and to transition to more sustainable energy systems. So actually, this is, on the other hand, it could be an opportunity to show everyone that energy security, actually energy insecurity, is due to uh, fossil price fl fluctuation. And that so an in investment in a more secure and more stable energy supply uh, through renewable energy sources, energy efficiency, and so on, will only benefit um, all countries, and in particular uh, developing countries, which have a very high cost for importing fossil fuels and, and food, like these fragile countries that we're just speaking about uh, today. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't um, had a look today, but I mean, just, I mean, so far we have just one country committing to money to loss and damage. Um, but at the same time, we did, we did have uh, the US special presidential envoy, the climate change uh, John Kerry suggesting that the focus on failed financial pledges is basically siphoning attention away from, you know, the, the, the pressing cause of throttling greenhouse gas emissions, etc. Um, and he seemed to be more positive about reaching the 100 billion target. Um, but looking at it from an African perspective, uh, looking at, you know, what, what, what African negotiators and African leaders have been saying, um, they are pretty sceptical. Uh, about about um, what can be achieved. I mean, they're still waiting for that 100 billion. Um, and speaking to people who are sort of involved in the negotiations, they want they want more than 100 billion. They, they need more up to 140 billion. Um, so just to look at, you know, what we've been saying about climate financing, Andrew, and, you know, what we what we've been recommending. Um, can you recommend sort of any sort of quick wins uh, that that, you know, people participating in COP could achieve just some quick wins that would 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 solve some more, more immediate problems sure thanks for that nazneen i think you alluded to one uh, earlier in your you know in your exposition about the stages of cop i think it's very encouraging that loss and damages is on the formal agenda you know it's a very politically contentious issue uh but i think it certainly needs to be discussed in formal mechanisms to kind of explore what they would look like what the parameters would look like and to clarify for the audience loss and damages are kind of irrevocable unavoidable damages you know socio-political it's a very broad term of climate change in areas uh you know in the world predominantly so, so i think that's a great first step in terms of getting some of the goodwill and kind of you know getting getting making up for some of the disappointment that you know i i you know I, whilst i certainly commend you know to secretary or president trump by Kerry's remarks about meeting the 100 billion that's was a lowball number, according to many, ten years ago, and now it's going to be delivered five years late, right? So it's kind of, kind of certainly insufficient uh, to many who are kind of trying to get, grasp, uh, you know, some stability amidst, amidst uh, the climate crisis. So, yes, additionally, one thing that I think has been encouraging is kind of pulling from Secretary Guterres is uh, kind of a call for a comprehensive early warning in the next five years. I think that if delegates consider, you know, through through NDCs, throughout national adaptation plans and other mechanisms, of COP, how to strengthen early warning, you know, then we can kind of have identify the ability to identify hotspots and future risks before they spiral into violence or further instability. So I think early warning is something that, you know, doesn't carry the political baggage or the political weight, let's say that loss and damages does, but in terms of tangibly having the ability to impact and improve people's lives, I think it is a really, um, really poignant and really, 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 uh, really promising uh, angle. Over. Thanks, Andrew. And we have had, um, at, at COP27, there have been some side events um, looking at the impact of climate change on conflict, environment, uh, security. Um, and I think that sort of progress in itself, because uh, it really wasn't really on the agenda uh, in Glasgow. Um, but I think it's really important that we, we kind of push COP27 participants to not only to sort of unlo unlock these um, you know, long promised funding uh, deficits, um, but also really make sure that these conflict afflicted states and conflict affected states have a voice, you know, at COP27. Uh, you know, they've, they've been underfinanced, they haven't received their fair share. Um, and we all know, of course, difficulties of working in these kinds of places, uh, particularly when the example that we gave about Somalia, where, you know, large swathes of South and Central Somalia are under the control of um, the militant group Al Shabaab. And there's absolutely no chance of climate adaptation or climate financing or any kind of climate resilience being built in those regions as long as al-Shabaab is, is in control. Um, but there are many other areas of conflict afflicted regions, uh, urban areas, for example, where 
financing could make a difference and financing could be encouraged. And Andrew, for your research, you were looking into, you know, what are the requirements, particularly the, the require the official requirements for, you know, applying for conflict, uh, for applying for, for climate financing. Um, do you think that there's sort of any workaround for countries who are who are looking to access that money? Certainly, Nazi, and that's that's a great question. Um, and to not you know get too much into the weeds, I, I, to, be, to be to be I guess fair, I will say it is certainly a difficult task in a, in a taller deal. You know, for channeling you know millions and millions of dollars into oftentimes unstable environments, you certainly want to retain uh, you know a bit of kind of. Uh, yeah. Also, some of the risks by having mechanisms in place besides just simply dispersing funds. But the current process, as is, anyone will tell you, is absolutely uh, convoluted, to say the least. I mean, one thing that's particularly problematic is in a lot of these areas, to, to apply for some of these financial mechanisms, you need to uh, provide your, like, secure your own co-financing. Essentially, other uh, institutions, organizations have to put up money to kind of match the amount that you're requesting, or simply you have to fund some of it yourself or through other mechanisms. That's extremely burdensome, right, where countries are spending their whole budget simply to prevent an insurgency or to kind of reach reach the most vulnerable and still falling woefully short. And even when some of these applications are processed, they can take up to 10 years. And in 10 years, you know, places like Somalia, you know, the, the outlook is bleak from a climatic perspective. And um, that's already baked in, regardless how much we reduce emissions, the next 10 to 15 years are pretty, pretty, pretty locked in. So I think, you know, finally, I guess, providing these kind of organizations more flexibility in terms of operational protocols to adapt to risk. Sometimes if, let's say, conflict breaks out and interrupts the mandate of, 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 a, of a resilience building effort, it can take up to a year to adapt. And that puts, you know, humanitarians, development partners on the ground at risk, but it also delays much needed adaptation. So I think there's ways to kind of increase access, but also increase flexibility and context specific solutions to make sure it gets to the most vulnerable. So we just had a question um, about what are the impacts of climate change on the African continent. So maybe I could try to, to answer that. I mean, we, what we see uh, is that around the globe, not just in, in, on the African continent, we're seeing that Indians are experiencing, millions of people are experiencing record heat waves. We have droughts. Um, we have, uh, for example, in South Sudan, um, recurrent floods uh, three years in a row. Um, we have rising sea levels as well. Um, so in terms of the impacts we are seeing uh, in Africa, and particularly in the Horn of Africa in the Sahel region, we're seeing increasing food insecurity, um, water scarcity, um, and also that's leading to some resource competition, you know, because of this disruption to livelihoods and because of people sort of migrating or moving uh, to areas where they can find water or pasture. And, you know, at, at the crisis group, we, we see that the relationship between climate change and conflict is really complex. It's context specific, very context specific. But um, as Andrew mentioned there, you know, half of the most climate fragile countries also face violence. So what really should be there at the top of the agenda as the world warms and it's going to warm if we don't do something about it. Um, this kind of climatic distress that we're seeing, particularly in Africa, is going to play an increasingly important role uh, in many of the conflicts that already exist and many of the future conflicts that we're going to see. Um, but let's just, um, so Andrew, you want to come in? Yeah, just just one quick point. I think that's an excellent you know point talking about the compound vulnerability, what we like to call it a crisis group, to both climate change and violence. But this new research illustrates that that is perpetuated in the form of systematic struggles to access and implement finance, right? So these countries are predisp predisposed to climate change and violence already, and now they're not receiving the money that they need to adapt and build resilience, which is going to further amplify right the future risks. So we're, we're witnessing in real time, unfortunately, this kind of potential toxic mix and perpetual kind of uh, you know, struggle for, for a lot of these countries. And I think that's something that the delegates really should keep on their minds as they enter negotiations. And just to let everybody know, we are recording this session. So if you join it, you can find the session on our website. Um, but I just wanted to give Georgia a final uh, word. Uh, Georgia, do you want to sum up um, what your hopes are, I guess, for COP27 um, from the perspective of OECD? So, uh, so thank you. I don't know um, to answer to this uh, to this question actually because because uh, uh, the secretariat uh, has no um, has a different role. What I can say is that uh, um, DAC members uh, in uh, last year they made a very important declaration on 
how to they wish to align official development assistance with, with in general with the goal of, of the Paris Agreement. And uh, uh, this uh, declaration, which of course uh, was presented to the COP last year, and, and we are members will update uh, at, uh, at this year COP, I mean, it commits in particular for an increased support for for uh, for uh, adaptation. So this adaptation focus is really it's really important. We think uh, in uh, in the African continent in fragile context, as you said. I mean, the the world the warms and this climatic distress will exacerbate insecurity and also armed conflict and and, um, and the problems of this uh, of the Sahel region for example but not only there so what we um, I cannot speak as the OECD objective for for, uh, for the COP but what we, what we see is that there is an increasing um, support of donors to uh, increase uh, climate financing and to reach the 100 billion report, 100 billion goal, and possibly to go behind that, but also to uh, increasing focus on on adaptation in most fragile and climate afflicted countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was Giorgio Dalberti, who is working on climate and environmental financing at the OECD. And also joining me was Andrew Chachi, who is a researcher at Crisis working on climate, environment and conflict um, and a colleague of mine. I just want to thank you all for listening in to, to space. I hope we managed to answer some of the questions on, you know, looking at the impact of climate change and conflict and security, but also looking at the important issue of climate fighting as well uh, at COP27, which is happening right now in Egypt. You can get more information. Uh, from our website at www.crisisgroup.org, uh, where we have a COP campaign page, also on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram as well. Um, and we're recording this, so if you joined in late, you can you can listen in um, to the recording as well. But thank you so much again for joining us. Sorry about the audio issues, and have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Bye-bye. <laughs>